thank you very much. So I'm going to be speaking today, the title of my talk, The Ethiopian Echoes of Landscape of Bath and the Lessons that Those Echoes Can Teach Us. Lesson number one, that you can find sanctity in unexpected places. So this is Fairfield House. It's a very beautiful Italian villa built in the mid-18th century. It was the former home of an Irish mayor, and it's, this became refuge and sanctuary to one of the oldest monarchies in the world. And this is the monarchy of Ethiopia. This is Haile Selassie and Empress Menin. Haile Selassie is the 225th descendant of Solomon and Sheba, Queen Makeda, as she was then known. And this is documented in a text called the Keba Nagast, the Glory of the Kings, which is one of the oldest Ethiopian texts. Empress Menin, his wife, is descendant of Prophet Muhammad. So this is no ordinary couple. This is a very special royal family. Um, the circumstances that they came to Bath is because in 1935, in October 1935, Mussolini's Italian fascist troops invaded Ethiopia and the emperor fought on the front line for a long period of time, but it got to the point where he realized that he had to leave Ethiopia and come to the West for rally for more support for Ethiopian liberation. And they say that one of the reasons why he came to Bath is because he had mustard gas burns on his hands from the wounds of the war, and he sought solace in the city of Bath. So he would have driven up this driveway. This is the driveway to Fairfield House, onto Fairfield House. Um, I've taken this photograph as a metaphor of a precarious sanctity. These are fruits and apples that have fallen onto the floor and they're enjoying this precarious sanctity between the wheels of the cars that drive down that driveway. And very much that's the precarious nature that the royal family found themselves in at Fairfield House. And we often wonder how it is that the emperor came to live in an in Italian villa, in an Italian Roman city, while he's been impressed by Rome itself back in Ethiopia. So that's the first lesson. Second lesson, the need for calmness in times of crisis. So the royal family came to Bath, as we saw in that previous slide as well. He was a family man. This is the photograph taken at Fairfield House with his family, his children, his grandchildren. And so at this time of extreme um, turmoil, crisis, tension, and stress for the royal family. He saw his comrades dying on the battlefield. He used to go to the little theatre cinema in, in Bath and watch the newsreel films um, that we now know as British Pathé films, and he used to watch as his comrades are getting slaughtered. So it was a very stressful time, but at the same time, because he's a family man, um, he also had to create a sense of normality and calmness for his children. Fairfield House itself had a set of balances. It was a family home. It was the government in exile. The Ethiopian government in exile was in Bath. And it was also a spiritual space. The Ethiopian Orthodox priests lived there. And there was a greenhouse that they set up as a chapel. So it had these three sets of balances. And the emperor was also in charge of his entourage across Europe and across the Americas as well. So there was a lot going on. But in this house, he had to create a sense of normality and safety for his children. Now, one of the ways he did this was through quite curiously, through music. We know that at Fairfield House there was a pianola, which is an automated piano, which plays music when you press the pedals of the piano. And the Ethiopian family used to enjoy listening to music on this pian pia pianola. And we got the pianola donated back to Fairfield House. It ended up in Portsmouth, and I had an email to say, would you like the pianola back. I was like, yes, please, thank you very much. Um, and very kind donation back. And this is in uh, 2013 um, with some volunteers from Fairfield House, and they're bringing the pianola back up the driveway. And we've got the music as well that the royal family used to listen to, ragtime music, classical music. Um, and I became interested in this. And part of my research, I started to ask people, what music do you listen to? You know, this is a circumstance where the emperor was in, as I said before, the time of crisis, time of stress. 
So what music do you listen to in times of stress and, you know, when you want a bit of sanctity and safety? And I had a whole range of different music genres came back in the answers. Some people, they talked about relationship, they talked about grief, talked about a whole range of different kind of life experience, but then where music played these kind of pivotal points and created a bit of a safety bubble um, around that happening. And some of the music people listen to when they're both sad and also when they're happy. And that, 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 that kind of key um, role that music plays in our lives. The Rastafari community um, see Haile Selassie as deity, as their god. This is a photograph of Fairfield House with the pianola in the background with its cover, and it's got the Nyabingi drums in front of it, which are traditional uh, Rastafari drums. And the Rastafari are the set of people that talk about our connection with Africa from, you know, through the slavery, the journey of slavery ended up in the Americas of the West Indies, and now thinking about and talking about that connection back to our motherland. Part of the drum beat that the Nyabingi use is the heartbeat, and it's very much this rhythmic chant, and they chant for hours with this drum beat sound going over the top, but they see Haile Selassie as this connection back to the motherland. And one of the chants that they do is the Psalms. One, Psalm 137, you may recognize. By the rivers of Babylon, where we sat down, and there we wept when we remembered Zion. Carried us away in captivity, required from us a song. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? So the story of the biblical struggle, the, you know, the Jews that were taken into exile and what that story talks about is then talking about you know, the Africans taken through slavery into the new world, as it were. And the Rastafari used that and used that psalm to get this sense of comfort of us now in a strange land. And Haile Selassie was no different. He was in exile. He's a refugee that found solace in the city of Bath. And he actually talks about in his autobiography, which he partly wrote in Fairfield House, he wrote about how affectionate the people of Bath were to him, how they gave him a sense of comfort in his time of turmoil. And we've had lots of stories and all histories of people saying, you know, I met the emperor or my mother or father met the emperor and lots of affectionate stories. Um, when Haile Selassie went back to Ethiopia, he named one of his palaces Fairfield after Fairfield House. And he also gave Fairfield House itself to the city of Bath as a gift to be used for older people. And we continue to use it for that purpose today. So these echoes are continuing in the present. Um, and really important. So this idea of the heartbeat, music as a solace and as a solve and as a healing metaphor is vitally important. Number three, history does not stay in the past. So this is a photograph of a gentleman called Blattinger Haraway Walder Selassie. Um, he was His Majesty's closest friend. He was the foreign advisor. He was also an academic, a scholar. Um, a lecturer, he used to lecture at School of War and South African Studies, and he was world-renowned in Ethiopia itself, as well as in the wider world. Um, so he came to Fairfield House as a foreign advisor, and he passed away, sadly, 19 September uh, 1938, and he's buried in Locksbrook Cemetery, which is just down the road from Fairfield House. Um, this is what this grave looked like, in 2014, it became very dilapidated. It's originally a very beautiful grave. I originally saw the grave in 1999, and it's got really beautiful Amharic, which is Ethiopian, writing on there. And it's, you know, it's a very beautiful grave. Um, I met the family of uh, Blattinger Hellway at Fairfield House. It was the granddaughter. Um, and I told her, yeah, your grandfather's grave down at Locksbrook Cemetery. And she had no idea it was there. The body's actually, actually exhumed, and it's back in um, Ethiopia, but the grave is still there. So she had no idea that the grave was in, in Bath. She was there at Fairfield House with the Ethiopian community having a celebration. So I took her and the family that she was with down to Locksbrook Cemetery, and this is the site that we saw. We saw it in a sense of dilapidation. So we worked with the family, 
and two years later, we fundraised and we got the grave restored back to its former glory. Um, and at that unveiling ceremony, we had four generations of the family that had come from all over the country to be there. And also there was Prince Michael, which is Haile Selassie's grandson. Um, and, you know, we did a lovely unveiling. And it's a very important, special time for this family that they're now in the West, they're now living here, and they've got a sense of comfort and somewhere that they can come to and enjoy and remember their grandfather. As a right angle to that grave, to Blasinger Highway's grave, also in Locksbrook Cemetery, is this grave, in memory of Mumu. And it says, a deaf and dumb African girl, she was rescued in childhood, taken from a slave vessel, and taken to the church and missionary school. This is 1857. Bath's connection with slavery is still an untold story. It's still a story that doesn't get much connection. And this grave in Locksbrook Cemetery, you know, I'm not sure how many people know about that, know that this exists. Um, but I'm interested in helping this echo get louder and this story to be told. You know, Haile Selassie wasn't the first African presence in the city of Bath. Um, Ignatius Sancho, for example, he's a very, he was in former enslaved. He then became a free man. He became a scholar, an anti-abolitionist. He lived in Bath for a time. His painting, he was painted by Gainsborough. This is how renowned Ignatius Sancho was in his own lifetime. And this is in the 1700s. So the Ethiopian presence in Bath isn't new, but it remains an untold story. And it's a story that I believe needs to be told because it enriches our sense of ourselves. It enriches our, our you know, we're known as the UNESCO city for the Romans and the Georgians. Jane Austen, but I would argue Haile Selassie and Herschel and everyone else also needs to come up there in our city narrative because it broadens our sense of ourselves, but it also broadens our sense of who are Bathonian citizens because cities belong to all people. They're never, you know, we don't have walls around cities anymore. You know, they're, they're blurred and they're boundaries and people come in and they enrich our lives. So I think stories like Mumu, I want to find out more about Mumu and I want to bring her to popular attention. So thank you for listening. These are my three lessons, but there are more lessons to come. But thank you very much.